The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're coming to you live from a place in my house <laughs> and from a place in Traven's house this morning too. Uh, thrilled to be here with you as we are getting close to uh, our having been on the air long distance from home for a year. We're, we're really quickly approaching that date. Ours is a little bit earlier than everybody else's if you're keeping score because um, we kind of uh, were testing it out just in case and we're ready beforehand. Hey, I'm really excited to be here with you this morning and just feeling the privilege of what it is to be here with all of you. We're going to be with you live for the next hour. And I have to give you a little heads up. We keep promising you Bonnie Yates is going to do the master class, the, the filing due process without a, a, a lawyer 101 class but she keeps being called into court. So we once again don't have her today, but she tells us she's fairly certain that that will be next Monday. So I I apologize to you and she sends her apologies too, but you know how this is with our guests. They are people who are actively working in the field and sometimes they get called away to be there. And all I can think when that happens is there is some kiddo who really needs Bonnie today. And I'm glad that she's there for them and we'll postpone our thing and we will we will get the opportunity to be with her. But I also want to remind you too, for those of you who are like, no, I need some Bonnie. We have a playlist just of Bonnie for your rights. For those of you who are joining the show for the first time, she's a special education lawyer and she talks about what your rights are in terms of special education. We're going to talk about that a little bit on our own today through the, you know, a different viewpoint than a special education lawyer. But we have lots of videos with Bonnie. So if you need your fix, head on over to YouTube or to our homepage, autism-live.com to check it out. Which brings me to my next thing. We're going to be live for the next hour. And our favorite thing here is, and our whole purpose here is to be interactive with you. So we really love it when you write in, say that you're here, tell us what's going on with you, or just say, hey, because uh, otherwise I'm just a crazy woman looking at a dot on my computer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and talking to no one. So I really like it when I feel like you you guys are there and I know that you're there. So give us a shout. Right now we are live on YouTube. I have to I have to be careful that because it's slightly changed. We're on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So you can check us out on any of those three sites. And when you are there, Sunflowers is saying hello from YouTube. Hello, good morning, Sunflowers. Uh, so you can do just that. All you have to do is be on the platform that you're on and say, hey, we are also live on a bunch, bunch of other uh, sites like Africa TV and Vaughn Live and places such as that. Hey, Jennifer, how are you? I'm so honored that you're here with us this morning. Uh, absolutely adore you. So, so thrilled that you are here. So look at all those places that we also podcast to. We are a free download wherever you can get your podcast. There's Shazmoon. Hello. How are you on Facebook? Uh, look at that. Deezer, Spotify, all those different places where you can download us for free, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Music, like all of those places. If you go to where you get your podcasts and you don't see us, then please let us know because Traven is so good and he likes to be in all places. And if there's some place we're not, it's because he doesn't know, which is very rare, very rare. Um, but let us know. And then Traven will check that out and see if he can get us there. We do, we like to be places where it's no cost to you. 
that's one of my things. Cause I just don't feel like you should have to pay for information because heaven knows there's plenty of other platforms where you have to pay for information. So I want you to save your, your dollars and your shekels for those sites. Let's be free here. And we're very grateful to our underwriters and our sponsors. Oh, good morning. Uh, I'm somebody wrote in and said, I'm from England and I'm a mother of a very special daughter. And I I'm so thrilled that you are here. We've got a lot of moms uh, with daughters uh, showing up here on our feed, and that's really wonderful. Hi, Maureen from India. India is in the house. I love that. So thrilled that you are here. Absolutely love that. Uh, I do want to remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com, and when you go there, our library of videos are available there, and we sort of segment them into things that we think although we gave up mind reading, but we think that it will suit you. But if you say, hey, you know what I really need? I need a way to search this and it's not working for me. Would you please let us know? Because I know sometimes I go on a website and I find myself um, fatutzed because I can't find, it's not user-friendly for me. It might be user-friendly for the guy who created it uh, in Silicon Valley, but for what I need, it's not working. And I would hate to think that that's happening on our website. So please give us some feedback if you need a different way to search. We absolutely love Bhutan in the house. That's wonderful. Good morning. I feel I feel very international this morning. Um, that's what it feels like. Uh, and I'm, I'm so enjoying having all of you be here with us. But again, check out our videos, autism-live.com, or we also have our library of videos on our YouTube channel, which is just um, autism, ex excuse me, youtube.com slash autism live. I like to remind you at the start of shows when we have an opportunity that we have lots of guests that are on the shows that are experts and are wonderful. I want you to remember that while I speak very stridently and have many opinions, which I consider informed opinions, but other people don't, um, I'm not an expert, not in autism. Um, I, you know, I'm a, how many years, 16 year veteran of uh, having had my child get a diagnosis. And I've been covering autism journalistically for more than 10 years, but that does not make me an expert. And I want to be super duper clear about that. However, I've interviewed a lot of experts and I have a lot of opinions and I'm happy to share those with you if you would like uh, my opinion on something. But when you want an expert opinion, um, please let us know because I love calling them up and saying, hey, I've got a viewer who wants to know X, Y, or Z. Can't always find the answer, but I can always find more information. And that's, I think, a value. So please feel free to write into us. If you're watching in podcast and you're like, I don't know how to write in a question, just go to our website, autism-live.com. Put it in the chat at the very bottom of the page. It is not a live chat. You will not get a response back. We don't have a way to respond back on that chat, but we can then discuss it on the next live show that we do. So I encourage you to check that out. I use those questions really to start um, Ask Dr. Doreen on Wednesdays. And if you need a response back, please make sure that you include a way for some someone, me or someone else, to contact you back. A phone number or an email um, is usually what's best for that. Uh, I do like to remind you that um, this entire show is meant to provide information and inspiration to what I refer to as the larger autism community. That starts with the folks who are on the spectrum, who actually have the diagnosis. They are the beating heart of our community. They are our why, our big why, right? And so their voice, their opinion, their view to me is essential. We cannot do this show without that. And I wanna be clear about that. But we also include in our larger autism community, everyone who loves those individuals. Because I know that together, we, we're not, not going to agree on everything, right? How could we? We have such different points of view. Um, but we all, I think, are on the same point of view about making sure that individuals on the spectrum have the rights and the dignity and the respect and the opportunities to work where they want to, live where they want to, wear what they want to, identify themselves the way they want to, love who they want to, right? All of those things. 
Um, and we can all be working towards that while we have different viewpoints. So that's the community that we're speaking to here, those folks on the spectrum and everyone who loves them. And um, we know that there are going to be times when, when, you know, we may say, I may say something, a guest may something that might not be your experience um, because this, the experience in this larger community is vast. So we're trying to make room for as many different perspectives so that we can help the individuals in this community, if that makes some sense. I get very excited about that. For me, that's a, you know a big reason for why. My kiddo is my whole why, but I, I made a, a promise to myself um, and to my, you know, higher power that when, uh, when my son was diagnosed and I was at my worst day and I said, please help me to help my child, please don't let me be the mom who messes this up. Please show me what I need to do. And I promise if you help me to help my child, I promise I will turn around and help who I can. And that my friends is why I'm here. I want to help you to get to what you want to what you need, uh, you know, whatever that may be, call upon me, ask me for help. I will try. I can, I can promise you that I will try because it's that important to me. I made a promise. Uh, I don't like to not keep promises. Okay. So because it's Monday, we like to start off the show with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey, nani nani are those experts talking about? Why do we need to know this term? What's it got to do with us? And, and why should we tax ourselves to know what this is, right? My litmus test is if it's going to save me time and money and help us to get to the progress and the goals and the things that we've decided are important, then it's worth learning the jargon term. And let me tell you, it took me a couple of years. The first two years, all I did was complain and rail against the jargon. If an expert used a jargon term, I was on them saying, hey, I don't have a degree in psychology. Back that bus up. Explain to me what you're talking about. And what I found was then I'd get a master class in jargon, but we wouldn't accomplish in the meeting what we had hoped to accomplish for my son. And if he's my why, about two years in, I, I learned to humble myself and say, okay, I better learn some of this. But we're all a little bit overwhelmed, aren't we? It is overwhelming. I still, every once in a while, will go to a conference of experts in autism, and I find myself mentally baking cookies because I can't, it's like, it might as well be in Swahili. I can't understand what they're saying. And I try, I try, but I can't, all these years later, I can't quite get it. Right. So we, I don't want to overwhelm anybody here. So we take it one term at a time. I give you the actual definition. I make fun of it for entertainment's sake, because really what else can you do with that definition? Sometimes, sometimes they're not so bad. And then I give you the working definition and put it in a little bit better language. So maybe we start to get it. And then I try to put it into context so that we can all understand at least why it's important. But be gentle with yourself. If you don't get it the first time, please don't think that you are unique and that there's something wrong with you. That's all of us. You'll get it the second or third time. And then when it comes up in your real life, you'll go, okay, wait a second. I think I'm starting to get that. And then the lights come on, right? So let's take a look at what today's jargon term is. What, what's on the agenda this morning? I thought so. Uh, because it's that time of year. Did you all feel this morning when the clock went ding? March 1st, it's officially IEP season. So uh, IEP, one of those dreaded <laughs> alphabet land things that, you know, most times people say IEP and there's a little shiver that goes down your spine. Even if you're not sure what it means, it's like, oh no. And I really wish and hope and want for us to be able to flip that and go IEP. Oh yeah. Because get a good IEP, you got a good year coming. And this year, it's as important as any year and probably more important. So let's, what is it? Let's take a look. Our actual definition of an IEP, which is just to define it, it's an individualized education 
plan or program, depending on what state you're in. By the way, in Texas, they call these ARDs. Don't ask me why. They don't say IEP, they say ARD. It sounds like an aardvark to me. I don't know, uh, but I don't know what it stands for, but I know that's it's the same as an IEP. They just call it an ARD and I'm sure it stands for something. But an IEP is a federally mandated legal document that details educational goals for a specific child with the special within the special education scope. Okay, as definitions go, it's not that hard to access, but I don't really know what it's gonna mean to me. So let's move on to our working definition to get a little bit clearer about this. IEP is a written plan to educate a child with special needs that must be followed. It's legal. And so imagine that you were going to take a, a box and you were going to put all the tools for your child or for yourself into the box for the next school year. Like what would we want to be in that box? That's what we want in the IEP or in the ARD. Because Whatever's in the box is what we have have to have to use for the next year. Now, does that mean, oh, Jennifer, look at you. Uh, admission review and dismissal is what the ARD meeting. Uh, and she gave me an actual definition. An ARD meeting is a meeting of a group of people who help to determine whether or not a student is eligible for special education and develops the individual education program IEP for eligible students. Oh, Okay, well, now I know what an ARD is, uh, but we just, we've been using it indiscriminately with the IEP. So uh, there we go. Uh, but in any case, for the IEP or the, or when you get together for the ARD to make the IEP, you're trying to put together a toolbox that's going to serve the entire team and your child for the next school year. Sometimes, a lot of times, this is why it's IEP season right now, is that people are making the IEP, having the meeting, and they might probably be starting the testing right around now because they're last minute Lulus, like me. I'm not judgmental here uh, of that. Other things I am, but not of that. Um, so they're, they're probably scheduling testing and the IEP meetings right now for what it's going to be like in the fall. Now, some of you have a fall IEP meeting that covers it. That's all good too. Now, every year your child is entitled to an IEP meeting, but there's something called the triannual IEP. And every three years they have to test your child to see where your child is before making the recommendations for the next year. They can test more than every three years, but they need to test every three years. And I wanna say this, the testing is really important and I find a lot of parents will fall on different sides of this. Some parents say, oh, I want all the testing that the school will give me. And they allow their child to be taken out of class to go and have this testing done. And they will take your child out of class and they will test them with everything under the rainbow. Then there are other parents who are on the way opposite of that spectrum. And they're like, no, school can't test my child. And I want to tell you like some of the pitfalls for both of those things. Cause you kind of, I think it's, there's a median ground in there. That's much more beneficial to your kiddo. If you say you can't test at all, the school will use that as an excuse to say, well, you know, we did the best we could, but the parent refused and they will write it into that IEP. Parent refused to test. We were forced to do, and it lets them off the hook. We don't want to let them off the hook. There's a, a, a legal structure in place to not let them off the hook. So let's not let them off the hook. But on the other side, if you say, oh yeah, you can test as much as you want. And by the way, you can take my child out of class um, then first of all, your child is going to miss important instruction. And I don't know about your child's school, but at all the schools that my son has attended over the years, and he's six seconds from graduating here. Yay. Um, but in all of the schools that he's ever gone to, we get, you know, emails and uh, lectures and letters that say, do not drop off a lunch. Or don't schedule a doctor's appointment. Don't, you know, your child needs to be here during core curriculum instruction and you can't interrupt it. And I believe as a former teacher that that's a good policy. If we're teaching 
core skills like reading and math and and language arts and social studies and science and those kinds of things we want the child in the classroom because i always used to say as good as a teacher is if the child's not there how good of a teacher can they be right so we want the child to be there school sets the standard says child's got to be here that's our best case for educating i agree with that except the school says, but when it's convenient for us, we will take your child out of class, continue the teaching. We will take your child someplace else for maybe an hour at a time where they will completely miss a core concept. And we do this because it's convenient for us. And to that, I say, nay, no, 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 no. So you can, first of all, ask what testing they want to do. If you are working with any other professionals, you want to run that by them because once someone does a test with your child, that test cannot be used for a full calendar year or it's invalidated. So if you have another, like let's say you're, you have a, uh, a psychologist that's working with your child or you're working with an ABA company that does regular testing, you want to run those tests by everybody and make sure that, you know, because if somebody's doing the whipsy, Nobody else can for a whole calendar year. So you want to align with who's doing what testing. Your school will do absolutely all of the testing in the world, but check with the other providers uh, that you have and say, are you planning, you know, ask your speech and language pathologist, are you planning on doing this testing? If they are outside of the school, and you're out OT, anything you do outside of the school, ask them what testing would you like to reserve? Okay, so you can specify which tests and they'll throw a bunch of letters at you. They'll say the Nipsey and the Wepsy and the, the Toffler and the, the, you don't have to know all that. Just talk to your professional and say, which ones would you like to do in the next year? Um, but then I really encourage parents and caregivers to say to the school, uh, here are the parameters around which we can test, which you know, we can test one hour a week and it must be either before school, after school or during time that is not core instruction. And you will watch the school's head explode because they have so many kids to test. They don't want to do it that way. They really want to pull them out of class whenever it's convenient for them. And I say, don't do it. Let Watch their heads explode. Put it in writing. Um, don't, you know, uh, and I would always say to them, you won't let me take him out of class then, so you can't take him out of class then. End of story. And you don't want them testing all in one day because your child will get tired, right? But I do think it's important to work with them to make it possible, make your child available before and after uh, school, or if there's a study hall or something that you feel like your child, like I hate pulling our child out of a physical education class because I think that helps to regulate them. And if you've got one of those kids, be careful about doing that. But they could learn those skills. You could take them and play kickball later on. And the skills in the class, you could catch up on, you know, relatively easy. But if they're missing how to do long division, who no, it's not a good plan. So um, then you're going to, so you've got the testing, whatever testing that needs to be done. I always, when they request the IEP from me, I, the date, I will write back to them and in the email and say, yes, I can come to that date or no, I cannot come. Can we do this time? Or I'm not just not available at this time. But I always say to them, I will be bringing a tape recorder. This is your official notice that I'm bringing a tape recorder to the IEP meeting. Whether I decide to bring it or not, I put it in writing there because different states have different laws that you must provide uh, notice that you're going to tape record. Some say 24, some say 48. I say put it in writing the day they invite you. So that's just one less thing you got to worry about because you got to write back and say yes or no in the same one. Say I will be recording and say, can I please have any... Um, written test results uh, 48 hours before the IEP. This will also make their heads explode because they're running late. This is not your fault and it is not your problem. Let, put it in writing. You might be disappointed. They might go, oops, we meant to, tried to, couldn't. But when they do it, you will find that they are better centered at the IEP meeting 
and you are better centered at the IEP meeting because you will already know what the results are because a lot of the IEP meeting, they will go around the room and they will read the results to you and you're supposed to process it in real time. If you can do that, man, you are a rock star. I can't do that. I cannot process while somebody's reading to me about the big goals for my child for the year. So I ask for the test results and I ask for any goals, any new goals that are going to be added to the IEP. I ask for 48 hours in advance. Then I clear my schedule for the 48 hours before the IEP meeting. And I sit down with all the papers I go through. I have little post-it notes that are the sticky arrows right? That are different colors. I know, so crazy, right? And I have highlighters. And I, first of all, I correct any mistakes in one color. And I put the little post-it note with the arrow so that I know when I'm turning to it, that it's, it's a flag that says, because you don't want any errors in that. So if they say your child is 32 and your child is 12, it's a typing error, but you want to call it out. First of all, you don't want any inaccuracies in this IEP, uh, and eventually you're going to sign off on it, right? And things will come back to haunt you if you don't correct them. But second of all, I think when you come in and you have your ducks in a row and you got the little flags and you go, if we turn to page two and it says here that my child is 32, I'm sure it's a typo, but can we make a note that that needs to be changed before we sign? It sends a message to these people, okay, we are not dealing with a newbie. Right. And I'm so sorry to say that the way IEP meetings are, this is critical, critical that they understand that you are a person to be dealt with. This does not mean that you are rude. Quite the contrary. You go in and you are the soul of professional having it together. I know what the laws are. Right. And a lot of it is an acting job. It's just an acting job. I have uh, this friend, this dad who said to me, oh, IEP meetings, it's kabuki theater. And I was like, what? And he said, you put on your kabuki mask and, and, and sometimes you have the kabuki, I am gravely concerned mask. And other times it's the I am angry mask, but I don't raise my voice and I don't emotionally get disturbed. I just have my mask on um, and I'm doing a performance. And I love to think about that in an IEP meeting. And the performance is I'm a together mom or dad or caregiver, grandma, whoever you are, and I have this under control. <clears throat> so um, so you, you've written to them, you've asked for all these things, you cleared your schedule, you go through, you look for mistakes, um, and you look for gaps. Like I always say to parents, you know, take a minute close your eyes. Don't be afraid to dream. What do you want next year school year to be like? Like, what are the things that you want your child to be able to learn? What do you want them to be able to do? Move into that dream space without fear, because if we don't ask for it, we can't be surprised if the answer is no, right? But if we do ask for it, sometimes we get a yes. And how exciting would that be? So perfect example for me is that one year I was like, I, you know, I just feel like the social piece for my son just isn't happening. And I feel like I hear back that the interactions on the playground are not great. And at that time, my son had an aide, but they kept giving the aide a break during his break. When he was out on the playground, the aide would take her coffee break and go sit down and my son, like, like he doesn't have autism during the break. In fact, he does have autism during the break and his, the, the rules are less structured. So his, you know, uh, symptoms that he has are probably more present that are preventing him from, you know, one of the classifications is social, having social difficulties, not understanding what the social rules are. And that's the moment we decide to give him no support whatsoever. And what? Just hope that he figures it out on his own while the other kids start to, in fact, make fun of him? Recipe for disaster. And so in my dream space of, you know, what do I want for him was I want for him to be able to be on the playground and interact with different friends, find something to do, 
and to stick with it because sometimes he would go up to one kid and, and he would say, do you want to play kickball? And that kid would say no. And then my son was like, well, that didn't work. That's over. And, and he'd go sit by himself. Not what I wanted, right? I wanted him to persevere that even if one person asks, how do I do it? So in that dream space, I conceive of this idea. I want a goal, a couple of goals for him on the playground. And I, you know, kind of wrote out what I sort of wanted and went into the IEP meeting and said, you know, here's what I want. Now, I also did an extra step because, you know, you know, from watching last Thursday, I love me some skills. I went, I had the skills program. I went into the skills program and put the things that I wanted in the search bar and it kind of helped me to make a goal. And, and I was like, look at that. And I could even put it in the IEP language. You don't have to do that, but it's an added bonus, right? Um, so I went into the IEP meeting and I said, here's, I, I don't see any goals for him on the playground. I'd like to add some goals for the playground. Now this, this did a couple of things. First of all, it helped me to feel like I'm adding to what I dream for him to be able to do. But it also signified to them that I understood the rules that, um, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, provides for social goals for our kiddos because it says that the curriculum is supposed to help them uh, to be able to learn uh, both now and be successful in the future. And in order to be successful in the future, you have to learn job skills and part of that is social. So a lot of times the school will be like, oh, we don't do social goals. Mena, not true, right? So, and because they had him without any assistance during that program, because there were no goals, if you have a goal during a time period, somebody has to report on it. So I was in effect, without saying you need to have an aide on the playground, I was going, doing an end run, giving him a goal, which would mean that they would have to. And the response I got back was phenomenal. I thought they're going to lose their minds, their heads are going to explode. They were like, oh. Would you like us to do a recreational assessment? A what? <laughs> a what? A recreational assessment? Yes, please do a recreational assessment where they look at how your child interacts on the playground. I didn't know that such a thing existed. Nor did I know that there were there are recreational aids, that there are people who are trained specifically on how to do this. So they did the assessment, offered him a recreational aide who not only uh, worked with my child, but came in and worked with the teacher and did things with the whole class, the whole class. And the teacher at the end of the year said, this is like the best gift you could have ever given me, that this woman came in and taught my class how to play games together and not be... Um, she was like, Shannon, this is like, thank you so much. I learned so much. I'm going to give this to all of my classes from now on, what I learned. But it also gave the teacher an opportunity to sit on her feet, which she never got an uh, off of her feet, which she never got an opportunity to do, and have this other person, person teach her class while she watched. It gave her a break, an educational break for free. So absolutely loved it. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Somebody wrote in and said, no, oh, IEPs, no matter how many our kids have had, I'm still crazed. Uh, and, and somebody else said, totally relate. They are very difficult to navigate. It's a process. It is. But I do think that when we, it's sort of like when we do a behavior intervention plan, we think about, okay, what would we do before the antecedent to set the person up for success? So what are we doing as caregivers to set us up for success? And having those things beforehand, the, the goals and the, um, uh, the assessments, the results of the assessments, so that you have 48 hours to look at it, whew, for me, that took a lot of the stress out of it. Um, and then in all behavior intervention plans, there's the antecedent modification, there's teaching a new skill, right? And then there's a consequence. And the consequence of having a great IEP is that your child has a better year at school. So that was what motivated me. But I really think that being prepared, I think that, you know, at least saying that you're going to tape record, 
is important. I don't always tape record anymore. I always used to say to people, no matter what, tape record. And I kind of still really believe that, but strategically there have been times of late where I've said, I don't want a record because I want to be able to speak freely with the school and not have it used against me later on. Um, so you got to think about that. And if you think you're going to blow your stack, which I hope you get help so that you don't ever blow your stack in an IEP, and you always should feel empowered to say, can I please have a break before you blow your stack? Because if you blow your stack in an IEP and they have a recording of it, they will use it against you. So always, always, always ask for a break. Um, but I think those things, those are the things that have really helped me. And I have to say, using skills um, has really helped me with IEP meetings as well. And I've had some doozies. I, I, for those of you who don't know, twice the school filed due process against us. We didn't file due process against them. Let me be honest, we were about to, and they got there before us, which is a slimy, slimy move. But we survived. My kids survived. It, it doesn't have to be horrible. When you go into the IEP meeting, and here's the other thing that I always do. I always bring drinks and a treat. And almost always they won't take the drinks or the treat until the meeting is over. That's okay. I know they appreciate it. Um, now that we're having IEP meetings virtually, you really can't do that. So it's cost you less. Uh, but a lot of times what I do is I go to Starbucks and I have them give me the two carafes of coffee and I get like two dozen donuts. Or if I know that somebody is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over a certain thing, I will get that thing. Yeah. Um, because I think it's important Having been a teacher who went to IEP meetings, they're really disruptive. It's a time of day, usually during class, although I try to have mine before, but it's a time of day when the teachers are supposed to be prepping for other things. Um, you know, it's them taking time out from all of their other students for your child. Teachers are willing to do it, but it's, it's extra work for them to be at the IEP meeting. Not, I'm not even talking about implementing the IEP to be at the IEP meeting. And I do think it's, um, it's, it's an acknowledgement of that saying, I got you a donut uh, and a cup of coffee. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, Jennifer wants to know, is that skills tool for creating goals available to everyone or do you have to sign up for it? You do have to sign up for it. And it is a subscription. Um, if you call them, you can get 10% off just by saying that you heard about it on Autism Live. Um, a lot of times you could ask them, they used to offer a 14-day free trial. And I think that it's still that. They'll take your credit card number. It's that horrible thing where you forget to turn it off kind of a thing. But if you're mindful of it, you could get it turned on for 14 days. What it does first is you take the assessment and then it opens up the curriculum. But even before you take the assessment, you can type in a skill and it will show you all the lessons that have to do with that. My fear, just being honest with you, is it'll take you more than 14 days to figure out what you want to figure out because you're going to want to take the assessment. Um, but I would tell you, if you're really interested in that, write to me and I can help you to do the crash course and skills so that you can use it within the 14 days. And you might very well decide that you want to keep it after the 14 days, but I don't, I don't want you to keep something that isn't right for you. You know what I'm saying? So uh, you can write to me at s.penrod at autism-live.com and say, hey, I'd like to try this thing out in skills. It was so worth it for me um, because the other thing was that I got a behavior intervention plan. There was a new person who came on my son's case, the new school psychologist um, that they brought in to deal with me uh, because the last one I said cannot come, like I was about to get a restraining order. I said, she can't come in within my uh, so many feet of me or my child. I was that mad. Uh, that's a whole other Oprah. Um, but when you falsify documents, you know what I'm saying? I got no time for you anymore. So anyway. Uh, allegedly, allegedly. But anyway, um, so they brought in the new school psychologist and she came in, said she had seen my child and came in with a new BIP. And, and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't remember signing papers for you to do a functional behavior assessment. And there was like, mm, 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 mm. 
And I, but here I was, I was looking at this BIP and I didn't know what to do with it. But so I took it home. I sat down with skills and I started just trying to create the same BIP and skills. And all these warning lights were going off saying, you know, that this intervention has not been found to be scientifically uh, effective with this behavior. And I went back in and said, we need to change this BIP. And that was the last I saw of that psychologist. I was just going through them like they were a revolving door. So skills helped me a lot with the IEP process, a lot. Um, but here's the other thing. When I, when I take my 48 hours and I go through all of the things, what I do for myself, because I can make myself crazy, is I sit down the night before the IEP and I write a letter to the people on the IEP team and I start by thanking them. And I, and I call out people who have been stellar top performers, and I thank them for their service. Anybody who was not, I leave off the list. Uh, you know what I mean? So I could say, I want to thank Mrs. DeCellis for being the most wonderful kindergarten teacher on the face of the planet. And I want to thank this speech and language pathologist for, for being so great. And it's just so incredible, blah, 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 blah. And if I didn't like the APE teacher, then they are nowhere mentioned in the blurb. It's just silence. I don't go, and this person was, Pleh. I just leave them out. Believe me, they notice. Um, and then I say, here are the things that we think are vital for this year's IEP. Uh, and, and, and I will often cite reasons, but I go, one, um, we think it's, you know, we've seen tremendous success with this. We think it's important to continue X, Y, or Z. Uh, two, you know, we would like to add keyboarding because we see that his handwriting is not keeping up. Uh, so we would like for him to get a school issued computer because we feel like this is important, you know, and appropriate for him, blah, 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 blah. Three, Right. And I just go down through the list. We want to keep this. We want to add this. We want to delete this. And I get it all and I edit it. And my husband looks at it. We get it all perfect. And then I, before I go to bed, I print like three copies of that out and I don't sign them. And I go to the IEP with them. And when it's when the teachers start talking and they're about to give their reports about the different um, things that they assessed, I say, can we just speed this up a little bit? Because I've already read them and I just have a couple of comments. And then I go to my flags and I go on page four, we have a typo. On page five, can we change this goal to this? On page six, I disagree with this. Um, do we need to get another assessment? And often they'll just go, no, what is it you want? And I go, this, 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 great. Um, and on this goal, uh, he's already uh, done this goal. We've already achieved this goal. So can we bump this up to this? Oh, we can. Great. On this page, this, right? Uh, we, so we go through, do all of that. They say their piece. They'll, they will they go around and tell me your child's amazing. Your child's fabulous because they will. And then they tell you all the things your child can't do, which is fun. Not. Um, but then we get to the end and I say, okay, I have this letter. And tape recorders are still, and I read the letter. And now that's it because they've already said what they want. Now I've said what I want. And as I read the letter, I go, some of this we already have solved in this meeting, but some of it is yet to be solved. But a lot of times the school hands you, they'll, they'll do the IEP meeting and they go, okay, so that's our offer. Can you sign and say you accept it? Which you never sign in the first IEP meeting, right? Um, never. You always take it home, look at it, check for errors. Have somebody else look at it before you sign. Don't be bullied. You sign attendance, but you don't sign the IEP ever in the first meeting because they will sneak things in. So fine, uh, right? But but if you're not going to sign, if you're not agreeing, usually they say, well, this was our offer. And now you have to put a counter offer in writing to them. And that takes two weeks for them to respond. And it takes forever, Right. The way I do it, I go with my letter. They say their thing. I say, here is our response. And you still have not addressed number four and number six. We'll look forward to your response. And I get to leave knowing that I have completed the IEP process of the first IEP for me and the ball is in their court. And that's when my husband and I go and have something, you know, wonderful to eat, watch a palate cleanse, watch a fabulous movie. I'm not a drinker. 
If I was a drinker, I would have a drink. You know, you know what I'm saying? But I get to leave that meeting knowing I, first of all, I read everything so I didn't forget anything. I was clear, I was concise, because it's one page, I never go more than a page, right? Um, and that I put best foot forward, and then I wait for their response. And most often they come back very quickly and agree. Sometimes they didn't, um, and sometimes we compromised about something. A couple of times we did additional testing, but um, I gotta say that not only did it work out for my son, we only had one school year that was tragically horrible. Um, and, you know, I still kick myself about that year, but I look back and I go, mm, you know, I did everything except switch teachers. And I sort of wish I'd done that halfway through, but there were reasons why I didn't. Um, so, you know, hindsight 2020. But so most of the time he had really good years and my son's getting ready to go to college. And not only that, every school that we have been at has thanked us for how we handled the process and said, we've learned through this about what's possible to do with families and with kids on the spectrum. So, and, um, you know, in the beginning when I didn't do it as much this way, this is what I learned over time. I had so much stress um, and I don't want you guys to have that much stress. So there's IEP. <laughs> long jargon today, but we had time. Uh, I hope that you will take what works for you and leave the rest along the side of the road. Find your own way to do this, but please reach out with any questions about anything that I just said. All right, we're going to get on to the question of the day. We're still in the jargon. So question of the day is, do you know where your IEP is? Like the physical, actual, I'm not talking about where the meeting is going to be held. I'm talking about the physical, actual document. If I said to you, you've got three minutes to produce your child's IEP, how hysterical would you need to be to find it? Like, do you have any concept where the thing is? Um, and I will tell you right now, I don't know where my son's, like he hasn't had an IEP for a while. Um, but, but I have no idea. I could find them though, if I had to, but not in three minutes, but here's what I want to suggest to you at, at this, the very beginning of IEP season, while it's not a three minute thing is that I, this is your homework. I want everybody to find their child's last IEP. And if you, in the course of looking for it, if you find older IEPs, put them all in one file folder together. And even better, if you have a way to scan documents in, take some time, scan those puppies in, date them by the year, IEP. And if you really want to be kind to yourself, say the year and the school year. So if you say, you know, 2020 second grade. IEP, right? And if you have multiple children, put their names in there, right? Or just, you know, like first initial or first two letters. I don't know. But so that you can find them easily on your computer. I would also suggest emailing them to yourself uh, for an email that you know, because sometimes your computer dies, gets stolen, you know, whatever. Having it emailed means that you can you know, if you don't have, uh, if your email doesn't go away, uh, but that's another thing to be able to do. But then I want to suggest that you keep the, this year's IEP. And I want you to get a sheet protector that has a magnetic side on it. And I want you to stick it on the side of the refrigerator. And I'm just going to promise you that it's going to come in so handy so that if somebody asks for your child's IEP, on the side of the refrigerator. It's right there, it's in a sheet protector. You can get at it, you can pull it out of the sheet protector, but it's magnetic and you put it on the side of the refrigerator because nobody needs to be seeing it. People come into your house, your child doesn't need to open up to get juice and see their IEP. You can even stick it towards the back, like where the counter comes between the, you know, but so that you know where it is. The other thing that you could do if that's too visible, take a, a, a kitchen cabinet that you use less often um, and tape it to the inside of the cabinet. That's a great place to keep things too, so that you know where it is. And the BIP should be attached to it. 
And I want you to do two things when you look at it. I want you to look to see, is the BIP attached? And on the first page of the IEP, there's a little place where it says BIP and it has to be, is attached and has to be checked. Make sure that it is. This will put you in a much better place to go to this year's IEP meeting. And then when you get the new one, trade it out, right? Because the paperwork will kill you, right? Um, but it's important to be able to have access to the paperwork. Uh, okay, so somebody wrote in and said, three-year-old never in school has an IEP, but it was done during COVID with input from the father and I. How is the COVID IEP virtual done with very limited testing interaction benefit with the child? So a lot of schools put their testing on hold and many of them did testing when it was warm enough outside. Uh, so some people move testing up and other people pushed it back. You can request that they do testing with your child and that they do it outside. They will put an asterisk next, next to the testing and say that they did it during COVID. Some um, people are saying that they're not, the testing isn't valid because if the child couldn't see the the, the assessor's mouth, we have to take that into consideration. Some people have the cutaway masks so that that isn't an issue. Um, I would, you know, this is one of those cases where you want to feel your school out and you want to be as accommodating as you, your gut tells you that you should be. That, you know, you can say to them, no, I'm willing to have you test my child outside. Um, and the, the having it have an asterisk next to it, use it in your favor when it's appropriate. They're going to try to do that. So you can try to do that too. Um, but if they decide that they just can't test, if you are in a place that's freezing cold and your numbers are high and you just can't test outside, they you can suggest to them, can we create an IEP based on the last testing that was done? Um, some people are doing testing online with and big asterisk there, don't know how accurate it is, right? But if you have a three-year-old, my hope is, is that you're doing um, ABA. And if you are, you can go to your ABA provider and say, are you able to do the testing? Um, you know, I, I would look at it that way. Can you request your child be mainstreamed in general education setting in the IEP instead of special education and still receive ABA, OT, ST support for or your teacher aid? Yes, ma'am, you certainly can. In fact, in IDEA, again, that's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, the, the paragraph that we really just like, it's our thing always, is that every child is entitled to a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment in which they can have a floor of opportunity to access the curriculum. And, and every year I would take a different part to get like a little bit more up on, but that least restrictive environment is where we hang a lot of coats because that says um, that it can't be, if the, if the school says, well, we feel that um, it would be easier to educate them in the special education classroom. Well, isn't that special? And we love that you feel that it would be easier, but the law says that my child is entitled to the least restrictive environment in which they can access a, uh, the, a floor of opportunity to access the curriculum. So we would like a general education setting with a one-on-one -on -one aid. We feel that that would be the least restrictive environment. And you know what? that's really hard to argue parents out of. Schools will try, but they don't really have a leg to stand on. Sometimes you have to get a lawyer to get in there to muscle them because here's why, it costs them more. If they can take 10 kids, shove them into a special education classroom and maybe they have to pay for two aids, do the math. It's less expensive for them than if they take those 10 kids and put them in classrooms and get them 10 aids. So they will try to get them in a special education classroom or they'll try to get them in a gen ed classroom and to give them uh, one aid for two kids or three kids or five kids. I just wanna tell you, I have not had a good experience with hearing from parents about the two, two to one aid stuff. I, like it just makes me break out into hives. 
um, that's not a good situation because what they do is they put your kid together with another kid who's got behavior issues. And now this one person is supposed to be available to both of them. I, I argue safety issues to get out of that because it's a recipe for disaster. Um, but you absolutely, if you feel that your child has the ability to be in a special education classroom, as in they are not going to hurt themselves or anyone else, and they don't have sensory processing issues to the point where being in a room with that many people is going to be so disruptive that they're not going to learn, then I'm a big fan of pushing for that mainstream general education with the asterisk that most schools don't know how to do it. And this is super important that you get your head wrapped around that is that I believe that mainstream is almost always a better choice for our kiddos, but the schools don't know how to do it. And you have to put in time to show them how to do it and have your ABA experts come in and show them how to do it and to like let them be wrong sometimes and help them to learn to do it better. And if you're if you really don't feel like they're going to be amenable to that or you are at all fearful for your child's safety, then I tell you, be very cautious. Maybe this is not the year to do that. Um, but if they're not a danger to themselves or others, and by danger to themselves, I include, you know, uh, being a runner. If, if you're afraid that they're going to run out the door and be gone, you know, I, I there's other things I would encourage you to do. But you can have a kiddo in mainstream. You can have them have all the full access to, they can uh, resource, they can have a period of time when they're taken out of class and, and go and get retaught what they were just taught in class. Make sure they don't pull them out of core instruction to do it, right? Uh, you can have speech and language pathology happening, OT, uh, adaptive, phys, uh, you know, uh, the, the recreational aid, um, you can have an, uh, the teacher's aid in the classroom, you can have it all. It's all available. The question is, can you convince them that your knowledge of IDEA and the assessments for your child uh, are overwhelming enough for them to budget it? That's the trick. But it's absolutely doable. It's what my kid will have. Um, and he's not the only one. And I didn't discover it. I didn't invent it. Other people told me all the things I just told you. Okay. We only have three minutes left, but let me say this. Um, we never got to the topic of the week. I hope we somehow covered it. What's the topic of the week? Great IEPs. We did. We got there. I'm so glad. Um, so in any case, the main thing I want for everybody to do, if you're going into an IEP meeting, is to get yourself some sort of support. It could be your best girlfriend. Um, who, you know, or it could be your aunt who's a, a school teacher, just somebody to bounce ideas off. Don't take it all on yourself. Feel free to write in questions. I love answering IEP questions. Um, and I love it when people go to the first IEP where they feel empowered. Man, the first IEP where I was like, oh, I showed up for my kid and I did my job today and I feel confident in it was life-changing. So I want that for all of you. It can be that way. And let me just say that there are really good educators that are out there. And there are even some really good uh, administrators out there. A lot of people that are administrators at schools are, are not equipped. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They're not equipped to deal with what needs to happen for your child. Um, that doesn't mean we settle. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we have to get an ulcer. I learned that the hard way. So I, I love you all so much. Tomorrow we have uh, Temple Grand and Rerun. I'm missing Temple though. We got to get her back on live on the show. Um, but a Temple Grand and Rerun tomorrow, we have Dr. Grant Bichet on Wednesday answering your questions live. On Thursday, we're having a pediatric dentist who's going to be here to talk about dealing with uh, dentistry issues with our kiddos, particularly in COVID. How great is that? And on Friday, we're having Kurt Manichek from Smile and Succeed, the team program for success. Um, he's going to be back with us on Friday because we didn't have a good connection with him. Uh, next one, I will be empowered now. With COVID, I feel the school board in the upper hand. Hopefully next year I can get reevaluated. You can call an IEP anytime. You don't have to wait. You can call an IEP and, during COVID and say, this isn't working. 
Uh, but for a three-year-old, I got to be honest with you, I would not waste a lot of time with the school district because what they have for you is not what works for a three-year-old. It's what works for five and up to a certain degree. But for a three-year-old, I really want to encourage you quality ABA, quality ABA, quality ABA. Um, that is what has been shown scientifically to be effective. Get the good stuff, not the run-of-the-mill stuff. It's vastly, vastly different, okay? Uh, much love to all of you. I will see you tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Stick around. We've got a short message for you. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for watching Autism Live. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.